Welcome second graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. And we'd like to give a special welcome to the second graders at Thomas L. Marcellus Elementary STEAM Academy, the second graders at Hodgkiss Elementary, and the second graders at the Solar Preparatory School for Girls. Thank you all for registering for this uh, field trip with us this morning. If you are watching this and have not registered yet, uh, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register to get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. Uh, we just use that information for attendance purposes. And today's field trip is going to be all about changes in materials. So during this virtual field trip, students will compare changes in materials caused by heating and cooling. And students will also observe that things can be done to materials such as folding, cutting, and sanding to change their physical properties. So we're gonna start off the day by uh, looking at how to fold materials. Then we're gonna move on to sanding materials. Then we'll move on to cutting materials. And then at, at the end, we're gonna do a bouncy ball investigation. And while we're doing all of that, you can ask us questions, but since this is a virtual field trip, you need to ask us using a website. And that website is www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. Um, if you go there, you'll fill a sh very short form and you can ask us any question you have related to changes in materials and as many questions as you like. And we'll do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this morning. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Miss Nash, who is going to show us um, how to fold materials. Hello, welcome to my classroom, second grade. So today we're going to be talking about folding. And I think folding is so interesting. I've been having so much fun since I decided to present about folding. So folding is fun. It's also useful at home. We need to be able to fold up our clothes to keep them nice and tidy in the drawer. We need to fold up our towels and other things to keep them nice and, and compact. Okay. They're all jumbled up, they take up more room. So folding is important. The thing about folding, it you need to practice. So you always need to start with the corners, okay? Put the corners together first, and like that. And then from there, you just start folding. Now, so we fold things, we can fold our hands, we can fold our arms. In nature, some kinds of plants actually fold up their leaves at night. We have a plant out in the, in the preserve that if you touch it, it will fold up its teeny tiny leaves. To kind of look, I think, think that's delicious. Now, birdies, of course, fold their wings okay, when they stop flying. The bats fold their wings. When they stop flying, butterflies open and close their wings, fold them and open them to warm up. And we have a really interesting butterfly that when it folds its wings, it looks just like a dead leaf. So by folding its wings, it's protected. It's got great camouflage. And we have a similar butterfly out in the post up preserve. And maybe someday, you can come out on a real field trip and we can go find that butterfly. Now, some materials are easier to fold than others. A rock is not very good to fold. A piece of tile, no, not good. A piece of wood, not very good. Sometimes it depends on the thickness. So if I have a piece of, if I have a, a aluminum pie pan, I can't fold it. If I have a piece of aluminum foil, I can certainly fold it up. And the interesting thing here is you can really fold this down tiny. So I can see how many times you can fold it. And it folds up really tiny. And then finally you get to a point when I think that's as far as I can go. Because it's gotten really thick now. But that's a fun thing to try and see how, much, how many times you can fold it. I can fold a paper plate, but I can't fold a china. So it just depends. The best thing for folding, though, is paper. So you probably have paper around. You can use scrap paper, recycled paper, to practice some folding. 
So if you take just a piece of regular paper, you can fold it in half like that. And then you fold it in half again. Now I have four. Right. I have two. Now I have four. Now if I take that one and fold it in half again, how many am I going to have? What do you think? I'm going to have eight. If I fold that one in half, I'm going to have 16. And if I fold that in half, I'll have 32. So every time I folded it, I doubled. So I had two, then I had four, then I had eight, then I had 16, and so on. So it's a kind of interesting little math project. Now, when we have folded your paper, you've got what we call a grid. And you can trace those lines on a pencil or a crayon. And then you could write numbers or draw some pictures, some things you see, things you imagine. Now, if you want to make other shapes, it's easy to make a square. If you want to make a square, it's of a rectangle like that. You have to take your regular 8 by 11 paper. And again, whenever you do this, it's important to keep your edges together. And you fold it like that. Then you have a piece left over here. And you can take your scissors and just cut along that line. And then you have a square. And now you have a square. And then you start folding that, you make two triangles, four triangles, and eight triangles. You can also fold that into squares. Now the piece that you cut off, you can do something else with. You can fold it like an accordion, and you can make yourself a little storybook. Okay. Caterpillar egg, the little caterpillar eating, the chrysalis, and the adult butterfly. So you can make yourself a little book. Now, you can also make paper airplanes. Make a fan. These are easy. You can start studying origami, the Japanese art of paper folding. And if you really want to have some fun, you can look up on the, on the computer, get a grown-up to help you. But origami, okay. Pretty simple word, origami. And if you Google that, you will get lots and lots of instructions. And some are easy, like this one. I got off the computer. Very, very easy. And all I had to do, I took a square, a square, I folded it into one big triangle, and then, then I folded down another triangle another triangle, and I folded the last triangle up for the nose. And then I could make a little dog. Okay. So some of them are really easy. It's fun to start with easy ones. I've been starting with easy ones. And I made a butterfly. I didn't make it work. It flapped. I made a frog that jumped. And then you can get really good if you practice, you can make some really good ones. A little shrimp here, a little crane, lots of fun things. And you can also just play with it. So I was really having fun just folding things into strange shapes. And then I folded my paper up a number of times. I unfolded it. And then I just took all the little the squares I had made and triangles I had made and rectangles I had made, all the different rhomboids and different shapes I'd made, and I colored them. And that was a really fun thing to do. So there's so many fun things to do with folding your paper. And all you need a magazine, newspaper, any kind of paper you have, you can have some fun with it. So use your creativity, use your imagination, and enjoy folding. And if you have any questions, I think Mr. Rotten will answer them. Thank you very much, Ms. Nash. Uh, 
we didn't get a question, but I would highly encourage students uh, when it comes to folding to fold uh, just regular copy paper into paper airplanes and see who can make a paper airplane that flies the farthest. If you do that, you're doing uh, at least three of um, the components of STEM because you're doing a science investigation. Um, you're going to be measuring the distance those uh, paper airplanes fly, so you're going to be doing some math. And when you fold paper different ways to make an airplane that with a goal of flying the farthest, uh, that is the beginning of engineering. So you'd be building something uh, for a purpose, and then you could try refolding it after you throw it to see if you can't get it to go farther. And um, you'd be working as an engineer. So and you could probably integrate some technology into it if you thought about it hard enough, too. So uh, that's a great activity to do. All right, now we're going to move on to sanding with uh, Mr. Monroe. Okay, good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and my topic for you on your virtual field trip with us today is sanding. Wow, what does that really mean? Well, sanding is a process that is used to affect the surfaces of some objects made up of matter. The object that I'm going to be using today is made up of wood, okay? Now, properties of matter. Usually, we usually look at those properties, looking at how they look, how they feel, and how they act. Miss Nash did folding. So that dealt with shape, right? With this wood that I'm working on today with you with the sanding process, it's going to be dealing with another property called texture, how something feels. Also, we're going to be working on color. The first one that I'm going to work on deals with color, but before we get started, we're going to be using something called sandpaper. Now, if you think about that, that word sand means there's probably some type of sand involved. In fact, I have some sand right here, and we know that that sand is made up of little granules of soil, and it, they're very hard. In fact, sand is used for a lot of different things. But sandpaper is created in several, several different types of textures depending on how much sanding you're going to do or how strong you need to sand something. We have what we call coarse sandpaper. And if we look closely at it, you can see the grains of some type of either sand or something that is embedded in the paper. That's the course. This is the medium. We still can see those little bits and pieces that are embedded in this piece of paper. And then we have the fine course. A little hard to see though. And each of these types of sandpaper is used to do various projects. Now, I have a piece of wood here that I'm going to sand, hopefully to change the color, okay? Got a bit of paint on it. But before I get started, I do know that as I sand, some of this paint and some parts of the wood are going to come off. And they may become airborne. They may be floating in the air. So one thing I want to do, I want to be safe. And if you ever have to do some sanding, I hope you get an adult to help you. But more importantly, you've got to protect yourself and be safe, especially your eyes. So I'm going to put a pair of goggles on to protect my eyes. Now we can safely start sanding. Here we go. See if we can get... And this can be rather tiring rubbing back and forth and all around trying to get a color change. And it may even take a little while to do that to get it to the color that you desire to change or getting all this paint off of this wood. Well, I'm tired, guys. And you know what? Sometimes it's better to use a piece of equipment. I have right here 
an automatic sander. Now, this one's not working well today, or either it's the sandpaper that's on this sander, but I'm going to show you how it works. Okay, didn't work too well. I've got to work on that thing a little bit. But listen, it is a little bit lighter in color. We can see where we've been sanding. If I continue, we might get a little more off. And you know what? Primarily, if you were doing this type of sanding, what would you be doing it for, you think? Well, I can tell you, if I was trying to get all this old paint off of this board, most likely my goal would be this, or my project would be this, probably to repaint it after getting all this dark brown paint off of it, maybe painting it a lighter color, okay? So sometimes changing the color is used uh, the way we use sandpaper. Uh, maybe getting ready to paint it a different color, or maybe just changing the color of the wood. Now, on the other hand, texture. You know, this is a homemade boat pattern. We use it with the canoes that we have out here. And uh, I would be really scared to use this out on the pond in a canoe because it's rather rough. And I would be scared that if I was using it to paddle in that boat, that canoe, that my hands may slip up and down the surface of this wood, and guess what might happen? I might get a splinter. So I want to take care of the texture of this paddle to make it a little more smooth so I'm going to be comfortable in using this paddle and don't have to worry about getting a splinter in my hand because sometimes those little splinters of wood can be very hard and they can hurt pretty good to get out. So I'm going to sand this just a little bit, lay it across here. I'm using the coarse sandpaper. I can see part of the wood coming off in dust form. But I can tell you, it is moving out. Well, my hand would be right in that area, so let me get that little spot right there, right there. All right. Yeah, that feels pretty good, guys. I don't have to worry about getting a splinter now. So, this type of sanding changed the texture of the outside of this boat pad, okay, which is made out of wood. We took most of the paint off of this wood to change it a little in color so that maybe I could come back and paint it a different color and not have to worry about this brown color messing up the color that I wanted to repaint it. So hopefully today you've learned a little bit about sanding and this stuff that we call sandpaper and how it's used to either change the texture of matter or even the color of some matter. Now, if you have any questions, I'm going to give it back to Mr. Broughton, Broughton and maybe he can answer those questions for you. All right, Mr. Broughton. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And the uh, question that came in is, are there any careers in sanding? And uh, there's not a career that's called sander, um, but there are careers that use sanding as part of their job. Um, construction workers uh, have to uh, sand wood when they build things. Um, people who design and build furniture, um, so tables or cabinets or chairs or any kind of uh, wooden furniture that you might see um, in someone's home. Um, uh, needs to be sanded and artists will sand um, things a lot of times when they're creating their artwork. So 
if you like to build things or if you like to do art, sanding is some definitely something you probably will use um, with your career. All right, now we're going to move on to cutting uh, material with Mrs. Fuller. Good morning, boys and girls. Uh, we're going to talk about cutting uh, and how it affects materials. Well, why do we cut things? We usually cut things to make them more useful to us. So we're going to start off with some art. These are called silhouettes. The, the boy is my son and the girl is my daughter. These are silhouettes, they're, they're both middle-aged now, but these are silhouettes that were cut freehand. The woman did not draw it with pencil. She took a black piece of paper and just by looking at my children, cut these out. So um, this, my son was in the second grade, he was seven and my little girl was four. So I can look at these and remember every single day because they're on my piano. I can look at them every day and remember what they look like when they were seven and when they were four. Well, this became a popular kind of art form about two or 300 years ago because they did not have photography. They had no way of capturing and keeping the image of children uh, except by uh, getting their silhouette. Now the word silhouette usually just means the outline of a figure. So uh, these were cut with little sharp, sharp scissors and black paper. Now here's a picture of someone from my family. This silhouette was cut about 60 years ago, but we still know what she looked like when she was in the second grade because that's when that one was cut. I'm going to show you two words. The first word is silhouette, which means outline or figure. And the second one is Schirensnitt. That's a German word and it means scissors cut. So Schirin, when you hear about Schirensnitt, you know that the person is cutting with scissors. There, there is an extension to the silhouette type of art and it's a scenes and they cut them with scissors. So that's where we get our German word Schirensnitt. Okay, so what other things that w do we cut uh, other than things for art? Let me put these kids down. Let's talk about food. This is a pear cutter. Can you see this? It's in the shape of a pear. In the middle, there's a place where the core gets out, and then all these sidebars cut the slices. Well, you may say, Mrs. Fuller, I don't need my pear to be cut. I can eat it out of hand. But what if you wanted to share your pear with your friends? You wouldn't take a bite and then offer it to them. They wouldn't like that. So using the pear cutter, we can cut the pear and it make it more useful for sharing. It's kind of tough to do, but I'm going to show you what it looks like. Can you see it? It's bought, cut into all these nice little slices. Easy to share your pair with your friends. So that's another kind of cutting. Now, let's think about food that we eat every day. What about butter? Well, we have a special knife for cutting butter. It's called a butter knife. Well, you might say, well, my, my dinner knife is just fine for cutting butter. There's a reason why they invented a butter knife. If you have six people at the table and everyone is getting butter for their potato or for their bread, if everybody uses their own knife, your butter stick will be covered in crumbs. But if you use a butter knife, you can cut off a pat very easily and put it on your plate and that way the stick of butter never gets crumbs on it. Isn't that clever? Well, you might say, well, if there's a special knife for butter, is there a special knife for cheese? There are lots of special knives for cheese. Here's one for Parmesan cheese. That's the crumbly cheese that we put on our spaghetti or on our pizza, and we buy it in those green cans at the grocery store, but you can also buy it in a big wedge, and it's a very hard cheese. This is called, believe it or not, a Parmesan cheese, a Parmesan cheese knife. 
This knife is specifically for cutting Parmesan cheese. We have another one that's called a pronged cheese knife. Do you see that pointy part at the top? It's got a serrated edge over here. This is for cutting cheese like brie or uh, uh, eat them. You cut it and then you stab it with that little pointy part and it makes it easy to pick up and put on your plate. Very similar to the concept behind using the butter knife. Now I'm gonna show you a third one. This is called a narrow prong uh, cheese knife. And this one has two sharp edges, one right here and then one right here. This is for hard crumbly cheese. So I'm gonna show you a cheese. This cheese is called Winsleydale. Winsleydale is very delicious, but you can't buy it in slices because it's too crumbly. You have to buy it in a wedge. So if you take the narrow plain cheese knife and cut down, a perfect piece of cheese for you to put on your plate. So that's another way of cutting that keeps the food clean and gives you the, exactly the uh, size piece that you want. Okay, well, what about something that's not food? Okay, let's see what we have here. I've got to see my timer here. Um, this, I'm going to have to put uh, safety gloves on. And safety glasses. I'm going to cut some wire. Here's the wire I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut it with wire cutters. This is so that I can have the right length of wire that I need for my project. So I'm going to undo the wire and I'm going to take the, the wire cutters and I'm going to cut it very carefully and it kind of pops off. Make sure you put this part in the trash can so nobody steps on it and has an unpleasant experience. Now let's think about something else we can cut. What about flowers? When you have flowers on the table, if you don't trim them, if you don't trim the bottoms, the water can't go up. So after a day or two, you have to be sure to cut the bottom of the of the plant, the bottom of the stem, so water can go up the vascular system. So I just trimmed that and put it in here. Here's some privet from the yard. I'm going to cut that and you cut it at an angle with the, the uh, pruning shears. That's how you cut the plant. Put it in there. It's going to be good for another day or two and they'll stay nice and fresh. It's a way of extending the life of your flowers at home. The last thing I'm going to show you are the way you can cut with scissors. These are kitchen shears or kitchen, kitchen scissors. The, the plant that I'm holding in my hand is called collards. It's a cruciferous vegetable. They're very delicious if you cook them with bacon and onion, but you have to cook them a long time and you have to cut them. So you cut the two sides off and discard, throw away the center stem, and then you just roll this into a roll very tightly. And with your uh, kitchen shears, you just cut off. I don't know if you can see that. You just cut it off. Maybe I could cut some right here in front of you. Just cut it off. And it takes just a minute to do. And it makes the, the plant very delicious and easy to cook. You can also cut herbs out of your garden like mint or oregano or cilantro using kitchen shears. If you have any other questions about cutting and how it can help us make materials useful, Mr. Broughton will help you. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. Um, there are so many different materials we can use to uh, cut materials. Um, I took a quick little walk to uh, a pear tree since I saw you cut a pear, and I'm going to show you that pear tree here. So let me share my screen. And uh, there's the video. And uh, there is our pear tree that we have here. And I zoomed in on a couple of pears, but you can see they are no good anymore. 
because um, it's uh, almost October. Uh, we those pears are ripe in the summer, and so they're they're old. And then I found a little surprise in that pear tree. So there you can see a dragonfly is resting on the pear tree. Sometimes you're looking for one thing out here, and you find something unexpected, but it's still uh, fun to see different uh, plants and animals out at our center. Well, I think that's the end of that video, and I'm going to uh, minimize this here and go back to this screen and uh, stop sharing, and we're going to turn it over to uh, Mrs. Ramirez, who is going to do that bouncy ball investigation. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about how temperature can change materials. And hopefully y'all remember what the name of the science tool is that measures temperature, and that is a thermometer. So a thermometer is the science tool that measures temperature, and temperature, again, is just the amount of heat energy um, in the air or in an object. So it generally tells us how hot or how cold something is. So during uh, the summer when it's super hot, we might see temperatures in the 80 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. During the winter time, we might get lucky to see some snow. It might get to freezing, so around 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So the way it works, there's a, a little red liquid inside the thermometer. When that liquid gets hot, the liquid will rise. When the liquid cools down, when it loses heat energy, that liquid will move down. So that's how our thermometer works. So what we're going to talk about next are, think about these questions. What are some ways that you can heat objects at home? How can we make things hotter? Also think about what are some ways that you might cool objects at home to make them colder? So when we cool things down, we're taking away heat. So let me show you some examples that I thought of as to how we can add heat or make things hotter. So if we want to make our food hotter, we can cook them on an oven, uh, we can use a microwave, we might use a campfire, we can also use the sun's heat and energy uh, to heat things up. Now what if I wanted to do the opposite? What if I wanted to make things cooler by taking away heat? Well, I could stick food in a fridge or freezer. If I wanted to make my drink cooler, I could add ice cubes. But also our air temperature gets cooler depending upon the season we are in. So usually during the winter time, our air temperature is cooler. We might see snow or ice. During the summer time, our air temperature is hotter. Um, so how does the temperature affect materials? Uh, so let's take a look at my popsicle. So this is a uh, popsicle that I bought from the grocery store. This is what it looks like. And when it's at room temperature, it's a liquid. Now, I forgot to get my frozen popsicle, um, but so this is our liquid um, popsicle. What could I do to make it freeze? If I wanted to turn this liquid popsicle into a solid popsicle that I could eat and enjoy, what could I do to it? So I could put it inside a freezer, and the freezer is going to take away heat. It's going to make my popsicle colder. And it's gonna make my popsicle freeze and turn into a solid popsicle that we could then enjoy. So when we add or remove heat, uh, we can freeze things and we can also make things melt. Now, do you think all materials behave the same way? So the answer is no. And so we're gonna experiment how different materials are affected by temperature. And in this experiment, we are going to be doing a bouncy ball experiment. I took three bouncy balls and I put them at three different temperatures. The first bouncy ball I put at room temperature. It's just a bouncy ball I had sitting in my room. Room temperature is about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. It's typically what they keep the buildings at school. So we have a ball at room temperature. Then I put a bouncy ball in hot water to make it hot. And then I put a bouncy ball in the freezer uh, to take away heat to make it cold. So how do you think temperature affected these three bouncy balls? We're also going to bounce the balls to see if their bounce height was affected. So what bouncy ball do you think is gonna have the highest bounce height and why? So I'm gonna show you a little video. I did the experiment this morning. Um, if you do this experiment with an adult's help, I would recommend that as soon as you take the bouncy ball out of the freezer, you need to bounce it. Otherwise, that bouncy ball is going to warm up super fast and your results are not going to be right. Uh, so that's why I couldn't do it 
um, a live experiment because by the time it's my turn to present, my cold frozen bouncy ball is already too warm and the results were not gonna be right. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and y'all are gonna be good scientists. We're gonna be practicing our observation skills so that we can observe the experiment and also be paying attention to the different sounds the balls might make when they hit the ground. Today we're gonna to be doing an experimental investigation to see which ball will bounce the highest. We're gonna compare a ball that was set at room temperature. We're gonna compare a ball that's been placed in the hot water and a ball that's been placed in the freezer. So let's look at some of our science equipment that we will be using. Here we have a hot plate. Um, a hot plate is kind of like a little mini stove top. It is heating the water inside this beaker and also the ball, which is floating in the beaker. Um, so a hot plate, uh, the temperature right now in that water is about 90 degrees Celsius or 194 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's gonna be our hot bounce ball. Then we have our cold bounce ball here in the middle. Um, it was in the freezer. It was about negative 10 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit in the freezer. I placed it in a beaker full of ice just to help it stay a little bit colder. And then we have our room temperature ball, which is about 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit is about the temperature in my room. Now we're gonna be using a data chart like this to record our data. We're only gonna have time to do one test today, but ideally a scientist would conduct at least three or four tests to make sure their results are accurate. Um, but we will be filling out our chart. And then we also have this height chart just to make it a little bit easier to see how high the balls actually bounced. And I just used the meter stick that you see above us to help us mark some lines. I used it in inches and in centimeters. We're gonna start with our cold frozen bouncy ball first because I don't want it to have time to go back to room temperature. So we wanna make sure it stays nice and cold. We're gonna drop it at a height of 43 inches. We're gonna use our sense of sight so that we can observe and see how high this bouncy ball bounces. So it's just above 20 inches. So we're gonna go ahead and put our cold bouncy ball marker at around 20 inches or so. It is helpful if we have a second person uh, to help you with the experiment so you can have a second person that's able to watch as well. Sometimes it's a little bit harder uh, for one person to keep track of where that bouncy ball is. Um, so that's our cold ball, just above 20 inches. Now we're gonna see how high our room temperature ball will bounce. This is our room temperature ball. It's been sitting here at room temperature, so it's about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. We're again gonna drop it at 43 inches. Again, we're gonna watch to see how high this one bounces. I'm gonna say it's around 30 inches. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my marker down for the room temperature ball at around 30 inches. So now we're gonna do our final bouncy ball test. We're gonna do our hot bouncy ball that's been sitting in hot water. So I put on my safety goggles because I don't want any hot water uh, to spray on me. And I also have um, a spoon that I'm gonna be using to take the bouncy ball out. So let me just take our bouncy ball out. And we're going to drop the bouncy ball with a spoon at the same height. And you can see this one went around 35 inches. So we're going to go ahead and put our marker down. So if we look at our results, we can see that the ball that bounced the least was the cold bouncy ball. Then the room temperature bouncy ball kind of had a middle height. And then our highest bouncy ball was our hot bouncy ball. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing our screen and we will discuss those results. Okay, so I put all of our results in this little table here. Um, I've been doing this experiment all week, so I do have uh, four test results. And overall, every single experiment I did, the cold bouncy ball always had the lowest bounce height. And hopefully you guys noticed that when I did the experiment, I did not touch that cold bouncy ball. And that is because after doing several uh, test tries, I figured out that the more I handled and touched that uh, frozen ball, the more I was just warming it up with my body heat and it was actually affecting the test results as well. So if you do repeat this experiment, try not to touch that frozen bouncy ball because you're actually transferring heat your own body heat to it and it can affect the results. Um, so why exactly did that cold bouncy ball not bounce as high as the others? So we're gonna look at this little poster uh, to help us explain. 
So it's important to realize that all matter is made out of particles. And when we heat or cool matter, those particles and their movement changes. So if we look at our cold bouncy ball, uh, we're gonna say that these little dots are the particles that make up the bouncy ball. When I put the bouncy ball in the freezer, the particles that make up the bouncy ball got really cold that they froze and they moved really slow. And because the particles became slow moving, they didn't have a lot of energy and the bouncy ball lost its elasticity. So elasticity is just the ability of a material to go back to its original shape. And you guys are probably familiar with elasticity if you've seen or used a rubber band. I can stretch the rubber band, but it's always gonna go back to its original shape. So a rubber band has good elasticity and so does a rubber bouncy ball. So when the rubber bouncy ball hits um, the ground, it gets slightly squished or compressed, but then the energy, uh, when it goes back to its shape, is what allows it to bounce high. Now, if we compare the elasticity of the bouncy ball to a marble, the marble doesn't have really good elasticity. You could drop it on the floor and it's not gonna bounce like a bouncy ball. I can also feel by touching them that the marble feels a lot different than this bouncy ball. It feels really, really hard and durable. Um, so again, elasticity is what makes a ball bounce. Now, if we compare the movement of particles in our warmer bouncy balls, like the hot bouncy ball and the room temperature bouncy balls, those bouncy balls had more heat energy so they had more energy to allow them to bounce higher. So the particles were moving super fast in the warmer bouncy balls, giving them better elasticity. So temperature affects materials differently. Did anyone think that the bouncy ball was going to melt when I put it in the hot water? Um, so not everything will melt at the same uh, melting point or temperature. Uh, so that's why it's important to do experiments so that we can test and figure out how materials are gonna react. Uh, so the last thing I want to do is just show you a quick little video of our farm animals. While you guys are watching it, I want you all to be thinking about how does the heating and freezing of water affect our farm animals. Uh, so be thinking about that question as I show you our quick little video. I'm going to share my screen one last time. Um, I love this video because you can hear all sorts of cool farm animals. So be thinking about what animals you're hearing. And there it goes. So those ducks were looking for food. They were having a fun little time uh, waiting in the pond, the little puddle there. Um, I actually went out there yesterday and that puddle is not there anymore. So what do you think happened to that water? Where did it go? Um, did it change into something different? So think about how that water, when it gets frozen or when it gets heated, how does that affect our farm animals out here? I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Mr. Broughton and he is going to answer any questions that y'all might have. Thank you, Mr. Mears. And the question that uh, we got was, um, would heating or cooling a rubber band affect its, its elasticity? And, um, you know, I really haven't tried that, so I don't know for sure, but um, that's something you could try at home. You could you could repeat Ms. Ramirez's experiment um, uh, just the way she did it with the bouncy balls, only substitute rubber bands and, and find out. All right, now we're going to do a quick little recap here of what we did today. I'm going to share my screen here with you. And... Uh, again, we looked at changes in materials. So during this virtual field trip, uh, students compared changes in materials caused by heating and cooling. That was the bouncy ball investigation. And then students also observed that things could be done to materials such as folding, cutting, and sanding to change their physical properties. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, this was our second, um, second grade uh, virtual field trip of the year. So. Um, we would like to know what you think about it, and you can let us know by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback to uh, give us feedback on today's field trip. Um, we do value what you think, and we use um, the information you give us to improve what we do out here. So thank you very much, and have a great rest of your morning.